The third thing that we should all know about special education services is how we provide services in the school system today. And one thing that I am passionate about is connecting with community leaders, clergy professionals, therapists, clinical psychologists, to talk about how we do things in the school system today. Because so many people are unfamiliar with how we practice in the school system. And so before I describe current practices, I will talk with you all about how we did things years ago. I think often when we have, when we understand how we did things years ago, there's a better appreciation of how we do things today. So I'll, I'll talk with you guys about how we diagnose LD in the school system today. Because often, many of our students may go to a clinical setting, receive a diagnosis of LD, come back to the school system, and may not qualify for specialized service. So the question is, how are you diagnosed with LD at the clinical setting? Yet, when you go to the school system, they're saying that you don't have a reading disability. That makes no sense. So I'll talk with you guys about how we practiced years ago and explain how we have made changes. So meet Bobby, this is Bobby. Bobby is awesome. Bobby is athletic. He's the best basketball player in first grade. He's the fastest kid. He's kind. People love Bobby. He's respectful. He says, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. But Bobby can't read. And Bobby spent the entire first grade year plugging away, trying to learn how to read. He would sit in the classroom and practice, and practice, and practice. After school, he didn't go to the park. He went to his bedroom to practice reading. By the end of the year, Bobby still could not read. And so at this time, Bobby's mother became frustrated. Bobby said, Bobby's mother said, you know what? I'm going to the school system. I'm going to have a meeting with the teacher, principal, and school psychologist. Let's go, Bobby. She took Bobby to the school. They had a meeting. Her frustration was, Bobby spent the entire year with you all. He can't read. How are you going to help my son read? What supports are you going to provide to help my son learn how to read? At some point, the school psychologist interjected. The school psych said, well, ma'am, you know what? I'll evaluate Bobby. And based on the evaluation data, if Bobby qualifies for specialized services, he'll receive an array of supports. But if Bobby does not qualify for services, he won't receive any supports. He'll have to just keep trying and just keep trying and just keep trying. So Bobby's mother became hopeful. She got excited. There may be some hope for Bobby. So the school psychologist evaluated Bobby. He gave an IQ test and gave an achievement test and found that Bobby's IQ score was 85 We'll talk about this, 85, and his reading score was 80. Based on these data, Bobby did not qualify for specialized services, which meant that Bobby didn't receive any supports. This type of thinking became known as the milk and jug thinking. So in previous years, Psychologists, what we did was we would give an IQ test and we would give an achievement test. So if we thought that the student was underachieving in reading, we would give a reading test. If it was math calculation, we would give a math calculation test. And so the idea was the IQ represented potential. If you all score 100 on your IQ test, the idea is that you all should be able to score somewhere around 100 on your reading test. 
If your IQ score is 100 and you score 80, there must be a problem because your potential is all the way up here. So this became known as the wait to fail model, often called the discrepancy model. And we used this model years ago. And based on this model, we found that 50% of the referrals for special education were for LD. And 80% of these students were misdiagnosed.